great and congrats for completing 50 percent of the course now we will cover some advanced sections in javascript this event section is like the start of the advanced section here we will cover what events are types of event event objects event delegation event bubbling and event capturing and then some short and twisting questions about the event i hope you will like them what are events how are events triggered very very important question let me show you the steps associated with an event first user interacts with the page and click a button then an event occurs that runs a piece of code javascript code which is mostly a function and then the web page appearance is updated that is the whole idea of the event now let's see the actual code suppose we have a button on a web page and now we want to show one alert message with the click of this button for that first we have to get the reference of the button by using get element by id and passing the id of the button as the parameter once we get the reference of the button we have to attach an event handler to the button here is the event and this handle click is the event handler it is also a callback function okay because it is passed as an argument to another function then inside the function body we are writing this alert message that's how all the requirements of an event uh, are trigger are set now when the button is pressed click event will be fired and when uh, which will run the handle click event handler and that will execute the function finally the definition of event is event are action that happens in the browser such as button click mouse movement or keyboard input great now this event will be like a fixed event in your memory right what are the types of events in javascript similar to click events we have many other types of events in our web pages or javascript uh, see the button click code here here as you know click is the event name and handle click is the event handler similarly we can have other events as well for example when you hover the mouse over an element for that we have a mouse over event then when you press the key down in your keyboard on your keyboard for that we have a key down event and for the up key we have the key up event if you press enter the submit event will be fired and some more events are like focus blur change load resize and there are many more but yes these are the most important ones meaning whatever action you take on your web page it can be an event uh, and that can be handled by the handle handler function so these were the types of events what is an event object in javascript very good question suppose you have a button in your html and now you are going to getting uh, sorry getting the reference of that button and adding a click event to this button now listen carefully here in the handle click function you can see this event passed as a parameter what is this event and where did it come from the answer is here uh, whenever any event is triggered the browser automatically creates an event object and passes it as an argument to this uh, event handler function uh, if you need this event object then you can put here as a parameter and if you do not need it then do not put here okay now the question is when we need it right for example if you want to get some information about the event that is just triggered then you uh, can use it like here you can get the type of the event or you can get the target of the event on which the event is triggered so basically if you see the browser console then this event object will get the event type as click so that is the information you are getting and it will get the whole target element of the event like this so that is the benefit of the event object okay that is giving you information about the event and here is the conclusion the first point is whenever any event is triggered the browser automatically creates an event object and passes it as an argument to the event handler function the second point is 
the event object contains various properties and methods that basically provides information about the event such as the type of the event the event uh, the element that triggered the event etc etc okay so that was the whole story about the event object what is event delegation in javascript very good question in short if you have a parent element in your html then if you handle the event of the parent element then javascript will automatically handle the events of its child element okay automatically so that is event delegation so basically parent is delegating something to the child so suppose you have a web application with a parent list with three child elements in it like this now when i click this item one item one is logged in the console on clicking item two item two is logged and so on now you might be thinking that in back in the code we have attached the event handlers to each child elements right but that is not the case if i will show you the code here is the parent list my list with the child items then you can see we are only attaching the event handler to the parent element only no event handler for any child element and inside the function body we are using the event object to log the target elements text content so that's how we are getting the element information by using the event object right now as i showed earlier in the browser on clicking the child elements i am getting the target element uh, text content of the specific child element and that is the magic of the event delegation we have just added an event handler to the parent element and that have automatically delegated the events to the child elements the conclusion is event delegation in javascript is a technique where you attach a single event handler to the parent element to handle events on all of the child elements so great now the concept is uh, fixed in your memory what is event bubbling in javascript very important question suppose in your html you have one outer div element and inside it there is one inner div and inside that we have this button with id my button basically nothing but the nested elements right now as per the event bu bubbling if we click the innermost element of the html which is here button is the innermost right then first this button events will be event will be triggered then the next level inner div element will be triggered and then the outer div element will be triggered so that is event bubbling you know bubble it will grow 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 okay so like in this diagram the event will be triggered from the bottom to the top of the dom and that is event bubbling let's see the code here first we will get the reference to all the elements and add the event handlers with all the elements like this okay uh, now here is the function see no extra code or setting is required if you trigger the event of the button which is the innermost then all the parent events will be fired automatically so that is event bubbling the conclusion is event bubbling is the process in javascript where an event triggered on a child element propagates up the dom tree okay and triggering event handlers on its parents elements great now i think in this life lifetime you will not forget it how can you stop event propagation or event bubbling in javascript for example if we have this html with let nested elements inside it and then this javascript code which will automatically enable event bubbling for nested elements by default right now suppose we do not want this behavior of event bubbling in our project or application then for that in the handler function we have to call this stop propagation method of the event object like this okay on so now on the web page if you click the child button only the event attached to the child element will be triggered and the id of the child element will be logged and that this method will not allow this stop propagation will not allow the parent element event to be triggered okay so the output will be something like this 
The answer is event bubbling can be stopped by calling the stop propagation method on the event object. That is the short answer of this question. What is event capturing in JavaScript? This is exactly the opposite of event bubbling. For example, suppose we have nested elements in HTML like this. Now, if you remember event bubbling, then as per that, if, if we click the child element, then the first child element event will be triggered, then the parent element and so on uh, from bottom to top. But in event capturing, if I click the button, then a first the event of the outermost element will be triggered then its child element will, will be trigger, triggered and so on like this so if you look at this diagram the, this time the sequence of triggering the events will be from top to bottom which is exactly the opposite of event bubbling now the question is how to code for this behavior uh, the implementation is also 90% same as event bubbling, nothing specific. The only difference is that the last parameter, the third parameter of the add event listener method will be true this time. So basically this will enable event capturing in JavaScript. By default, this parameter value is false and that's why it, uh, it was doing event bubbling. But if you make it true, then event capturing will be activated. The conclusion is, event capturing is the process in JavaScript where an event is handled starting from the highest level ancestor and moving down to the target element. That is the answer. Got it? What is the purpose of the event.prevent default method in JavaScript? For example, we have a link on our web page like this. Now the requirement is that we want to disable the default click event of this hyperlink. Okay, uh, for that, first we will get the reference as always. Then we will attach an event to the click event of this link. And then we will call the prevent default method of the event object. Okay, which will the, the suppress, suppress the default behavior of this link. And that's how the click event will be disabled for this link. Instead of that, this next log line will be executed. The simple answer is the event.prevent or default method is used to prevent the default behavior of an event and the link click will be prevented. Now you also know why this event object is important for us for doing various things, right? That is the uh, one function of the event object only, right? What is the use of this keyword in the context of event handling in JavaScript? If we have a button element on our web page, we can get the reference to the button by using the get element by ID, ID method, right? And then we can attach it to an event. Now in the function, this keyword will refer to the element to which the event ha handler is attached. Okay, so this keyword will refer to the button element in this case. The same thing I have written here also. So remember what this refers to the element. How do you remove an event handler from an element in JavaScript? Suppose we have a button element on our web page and then we are getting the reference of the button and attaching the event handler to it. And here is the handle click function. Basically, we have attached the event handler to the button event, right? But maybe at some point in our application, we do not need the event handler to be fired. We do not want to fire the event on this button click. At that point, we have to remove the event handler. And in order to remove the event handler, we will call the remove event listener method of the element in JavaScript, something like this. Here we will simply pass the click event, which has to be removed and the event handler function name. So the answer is remove event listener method is used to remove the event handler from the element. That's the answer of this question. Congratulations on completing one of the greatest events of your JavaScript programming life. Now we will close the chapter on closures in JavaScript. The first three questions lexical scoping, closure and the benefits of closure are very much connected here. 
then we will check the limitations of the closures and how the closures are different from regular functions ready so let's start with the first question explain the concept of lexical scoping i like the name of this concept before understanding this we should have an idea of scoping in javascript which i already explained earlier right let me show you the code first suppose we have an outer function like this and inside that we have one outer variable now inside the outer function there is also one inner or nested function like this now when we call the outer function that will all ultimately call this inner function now listen carefully the inner function is able to access this outer variable which belongs to the outer function which is basically the parent function and we will get the proper output so here this ability of the inner function to access the variable of the outer function is called lexical scoping and this is the base of the closures also right the conclusion is the conce concept of uh, lexical scoping ensures that variables declared in an outer scope are accessible in nested functions also this is the concept and that is the base of the closure what is closure this is a very important question and asked in many interviews before this we should have a basic understanding of lexical scoping and functions now suppose we have an outer function and inside that we have one inner or nested function now here you can see we are returning the inner function from the outer function right now when we call the outer function it will basically return the inner function only and that we are assigning to this closure variable then finally we are calling the closure function like this this will call the inner function and since inner function is able to access this outer variable of outer function because of the lexical scoping finally outer scope will be logged in the output now here are two questions that comes to your mind first what is the difference between lexical scoping and closure basically closure uses the lexical scoping concept okay now if you remember in lexical scoping there is no need to return the function and then assigning it to the closure variable okay so it's like closure is one step ahead of or beyond of lexical scoping okay the point is a closure in javascript is a combination of function and the lexical environment closure is like an advanced function which you can call like a function uh, you can imagine it like this uh, closure has qualities of both functions and lexical scoping now the second question is what is the benefit of doing all this right how is this uh, scoping uh, this closure helping uh, scoping helping with closure and why we need these closures that i will explain in the next question what are the benefits of closures we already know the definition of closure a closure in javascript is a combination of a function and the lexical environment now let's understand the benefit of closure suppose we have a function create counter here we have one variable count inside the outer function and we have one nested or inner anonymous function inside this uh, outer function in this nested function we are able to access the outer function variable count value because of the lexical scoping concept then we return the function by using the return keyword you can also give some name to this function uh, but at the end write the return function name statement then okay that's also the same thing now outside we are ass assigning the return of the create counter function to a variable name closure one and then we are calling our closure one like this closure one the output is one because initially the count was equal to zero but inside the function it is incremented to one so now listen carefully carefully and here is the important point when we will call the closure one again then might be you thinking that this is a separate call and the output will be again one but that is the surprise and the role of closure here this time count variable output value will become two how is it possible the reason is that javascript will persist or maintain the state state of the variable for closures 
every time you call closure one it will pick the last modified count variable okay variable value count in other words we can say that even if closure one finishes executing the value of the count variable will be maintained as the new modified values like one two three and so on that is the magic of closures now here i am writing some benefits of closure the first benefit is closure can be used for data modification with data privacy in the example we were using the closure to modify the data count and maintain it also persist it right but if you will not use the closure uh, then to modify the count you will expose this count variable outside this create counter function right right you have to make make it global or something then maybe some users or some developer will set negative value to this count variable okay or they will tamper it they will hack it they will set it to something which is invalid meaning the data will not be safe then but with closure you can put all the validation validation logic inside the inner function to disallow the invalid or the bad values basically then you are combining the data and the function together to access the data value this combination is called encapsulations also which is one of the pillar of the oops concept uh, then the third benefit of the closure is persistent data and state each time create counter function is called it creates a new closure with its own separate count variable okay for example if you see this closure one the last value was two but if you create a new closure using the create counter method again then this will be a separate new and different closure right so the output will be fresh one again uh, from the fresh count logic at the top right meaning closure 1 and closure 2 will maintain different states and run independently the third and the last benefit is code reusability the closure returned by this create counter function is a reu reusable co counter function right it can be used in multiple places and that is the advantage all right now maybe it's a long story so in short you have to just remember two things first the definition a closure in javascript is a combination of a function and the lexical environment second closures are used to modify data or variables safely that is the advantage what is the concept of encapsulation in the context of closures first of all what is encapsulation encapsulation is one of the principles of object oriented programming encapsulation is used in programming to make the data more secure here is the code of the closure and you can see that the data count is equal to zero inside the outer function create counter so basically data count and the function create counter are wrapped or bound together now if you want to modify the data count value outside this function okay anywhere outside this then you cannot do it directly by setting the value of the count that is not possible for that first you create the closure and then call the closure like this right that is how you can just read the data also some some maybe some data you want to just read you do not want that anyone should update it so better use the closure and as you can see finally we are just combining the data and function to access the data right that com combination that wrapping is encapsulation only the conclusion is encapsulation is the bundling or wrapping of data and function together to provide data security and privacy what are the disadvantages or limitations of closures everything has pros and cons if you see this closure code here you know closure will persist and maintain the state of data whenever you call the same closure again and again right now if some closure one uh, closure like uh, closure one is no longer required they must be released okay because the data values inside closures will persist and maintained in the memory memory of the javascript so the limitation of closures is memory leaks because uh, there is some memory occupied there and it is of no use 
that means it will impact the performance yeah right so basically if closures are not properly managed they can hold on to unnecessary memory because they retain the references to the variable they access right so that will then impact the performance which is basically a disadvantage how can you release the variable references or closures from the memory for example if this is your closure code then you can release the closures when they are no longer required by assigning null to them like this the answer is you can release the reference to the closure by setting the closure to null that will prevent the memory leaking of, uh, caused by closures what is the difference between a regular function and a closure that is the code for the regular function as you can see we are calling the regular function first and it will give the output 10 then we are calling the regular function again and it will again log the value 10 only right no uh, state maintenance here no persistence of data the conclusion is regular function do not retain access to their reference variables after the execution completes okay whereas this is the code of the closure and here is the counter one when we call closure one for the first time it will give the output value one when we call it again it will increment the last value to one and then the output uh, will be two so the reason is closure retain access to their reference variables after execution completes and that is the difference between them great now welcome to the world of asynchronous programming first we will cover some basic question about asynchronous programming for example the differences between synchronous and asynchronous programming then the techniques for achieving asynchronous operations using set timeout and set in interval methods and in the upcoming section we will cover the roles of promises and async await in asynchronous programming so let's start with the first and the simplest question of this chapter what is asynchronous programming in javascript what is its use very good question and very popular before asynchronous programming we need to know what synchronous programming is suppose you have four functions or tasks like this in your project then in synchronous programming they will execute something like this in sequence here task 2 will only start once the task 1 is finished at the end the total time taken by them is simply the sum of the time taken by the individual tasks but in asynchronous operations the functions or tasks can execute concurrently or you can say parallelly here task 2 will not wait for the completion of task 1 therefore in asynchronous programming the total time taken by the same task is lesser than the in the synchronous programming that is the high level idea okay now let's see the code uh, what other problems in synchronous programming there are which we can uh, solve by asynchronous programming suppose we have the synchronous code we are starting then we are calling two functions one by one and then we are logging the end statement now suppose that function is a very time consuming function like this here you can say it is doing a time consuming operation then we have this function 2 which is very simple short and it is independent of function 1 in synchronous programming function 1 will block the execution of function 2 until it uh, function 1 completes itself right that is the problem it will delay the whole operation and it can also hang or stuck the browser but in asynchronous programming function 1 will not block function 2 and both can run concurrently and parallelly other than non-blocking benefit both can functions together uh, will complete in less time right that is asynchronous programming and here are some points which you have to remember about it asynchronous programming allows multiple tasks or operations to be executed concurrently another very important point is asynchronous operations do not block the execution of the code very important point now the question is when to use asynchronous programming in what scenarios in real applications okay so the first can be fetching the data from the external api 
second while downloading the large files then while uploading the large files then doing some operations like animations and transitions or any time consuming operation so that is the idea of the use of the synchronous programming but remember one thing java script is single threaded not like c sharp or java which are multi threaded okay so basically java script can execute single task at a time but by managing the tasks execution properly by asynchronous programming we can somehow make them concurrent and parallel like uh, if one task is uh, waiting for some resources then at in between we can execute other function in between so that's how asynchronous programming is possible in javascript what is the callback hell problem how it how can it be avoided let me show you some very complex code here you can see one async operation one method it is accepting an anonymous function as a parameter and inside this anonymous function we again have one more async operation to call which is again a callback and then inside that is another async operation three method and so on and so on this way of creating multiple nested callbacks is a problem and is called callback hell the definition is callback hell also known as the pyramid of doom refers to the situation when multiple nested callbacks are used leading to code that becomes difficult to read understand and maintain now there are two ways to solve this callback hell problem hell hell problem okay the first is using named functions as callback okay so basically these anonymous function make the code more complex and unreadable right so if it is a named function then this code will be smaller and simpler the second way is to use promises and here is a sample code for using promises yes i will explain the promises in upcoming question but that is one way to solve this callback hell problem with the much simpler code uh, code in simple in comparison to this one the next way is to use the async await keyword it is ju it just the next level of promises okay that makes the code more readable uh, i will also explain that in upcoming question so these were the three ways to resolve the callback hell problem great as i promised after completing the basics of asynchronous programming we will cover the role of promises in asynchronous programming here we will cover these questions what are promises how to implement them and what is their use okay then what are promise dot all and promise dot race methods that will give you a full understanding of the promises so let's start with the first question what are promises in javascript very very important question in javascript suppose you have a piece of code p1 that does some processing now if you will apply promise to this prom uh, process p1 then promise will make sure to give back some result okay either the result is completed fulfilled or resolved or the result is an error so basically to ensure that we get some result from the code we use promises with the code okay now here is the pseudo code uh, pseudo code of promise the first first thing that happens inside a promise is an asynchronous operation with the help of the set timeout or set interval math asynchronous methods okay then you can see that promises are created with the help of this promise constructor and it is accepting two parameters resolve and reject which are basically callback functions only now the question is where is the declaration or the body of these resolve and reject functions the answer is that resolve and reject are inbuilt functions provided by the javascript engine only you do not have to write any declarations for them okay after the synchronous code if your promise operation is successful then it will call the resolve function and if it fails then it will call the reject function these are the some basic steps to set up a promise okay uh, let's conclude some points about promises promises in javascript are a way to handle asynchronous operation that is their first uh, uh, promise then a promise can be one of in one of the three states pending resolved or rejected no other state 
so when the promise is running or executing it is in a pending state after getting the result it will be either resolved or rejected state okay the last point about promises is a promise represents a value that may not be av available yet but will be available at some time in the future it means when you make a promise it will take some time to execute but in the future future means like three to five seconds or not three to four years okay so in the future you will surely get the value or the result either success failure with some reason okay that is the promise and that is the high level idea about the promise which you should promise me to never forget okay in the next question i will show you the implementation of promise how to implement promises in javascript here you have to remember four things first you have to use the promise constructor or to execute an asynchronous function then you have to use resolve and then method uh, and then method to settle the success response or you have to use the reject and catch method to settle the error response okay in the code first we have a my promise constant that gets the result from the promise constructor and now inside the promise we are using the set timeout to make our operation asynchronous okay after 1000 millisecond the code inside it would be executed here we are generating a num random number between 0 to 9 now if the number generated is less than 5 we mark it as a success and call the resolve callback function like this and if random number is greater than 5 then we consider it as a failure and call the reject callback like this in real applications we put the api calling basically inside this so our promise is now ready to run asynchronous operations now the question is how to run this promise and how to handle re resolve and reject cases for handling resolve and success case we call then function of promise my promise like this and pass the result of the resolve function as the parameter here so inside this you can print the result or in the case of an api response you can retrieve the data here basically but if it is a failure or reject case then my promise will use its catch function like this to manage the error and here again we will pass the result of the result reject function as the parameter so you can see uh, uh, then inside we are logging the error message of fa failure right here is the output since i used the random number method sometimes the value will be less than five and sometimes it will be greater than five so sometimes the result sen sent from the resolve method will be logged as success and sometimes the result sent from the reject method will be logged as error every time you reload this page the result will be different this is the simple implementation of the promises when should i use uh, uh, when to use promises in real application all right here are the cases when you can use promises in your applications for api calls file handling data fetching animations and visual effects and event handling in short wherever you want to manage asynchronous operations you can use promises there the point is promises are useful when you need to perform time consuming operation in an asynchronous manner and later handle the results when they are available because as the name suggests promise will not give you data immediately but it promises you to give the result after some time definitely what is the purpose of promise.all method very good question in short promise.all method is used to handle multiple promises and respond based on the result of those promises like this let's see the code you can see multiple promises here promise one two and three uh, simple promises with the just the resolve methods okay nothing complex about these promises now to handle multiple promises concurrently or parallelly we can use the promise dot, dot all method like this here you can put all the promises inside an array like this and then pass the array as a parameter in this promise dot all method this promise dot all method will wait 
until all the individual promises are resolved. Once all results are resolved, then this then function will accept the result of, uh, of all the uh, resolve promises in an array as the parameter and inside logging the results of all the promises. But, 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 if any one promise fails or is rejected, then immediately the catch function will be executed. Okay, so you are no, uh, any, any, any promise will be failed. For example, if promise 2 fails, then promise dot all will not wait for promise 3 and will immediately execute the catch uh, function immediately. Okay. And if you notice, the promise dot all function is returning the result like a single promise only. Okay. So finally, here are the three points about the promise dot all method which you can remember. The first point is promise dot all is used to handle multiple pro promises concurrently. Second, promise.all takes an array of promises as an input parameter and returns a single promise. The last point is, promise.all waits for all the promises to resolve or at least one promise to reject. That is the theory and the explanation of promise.all method. What is the use of promise.race method? Very similar to promise.all, just one difference. Here is the code where we have multiple promises. And here is the code where we are calling promise.race function to take all the promises as an array parameter input. Okay. The difference is here if even one promise will be resolved or rejected, then immediately either then or catch function of promise.race function will be called. So basically, the race function does not wait for the other promises to be resolved or rejected. Okay. So, for example, if promise one is resolved, then the output will be like this. Just hello, no other promise result, no further execution. Similarly, if promise one is, re is rejected, an error will be logged and again, no further execution will take place. Finally, the point about uh, some points about promise dot race are promise dot uh, race is used to handle multiple promises concurrently. Second, Promise.race will takes an array of promises as an input parameter and returns a single promise. Last one is promise.race waits for only one promise to resolve or reject. Great, now you know the answer. Alright, after promises, now it's the time to check out the questions on async await. All these questions will tell you only one thing. When we already have promises, then why do we need async await? So let's start exploring. Explain the use of the async and await keywords in JavaScript. It is very important to know the role of the async and await keywords in JavaScript. Okay. So here is the code where one function delay accepts millisecond time as a parameter and then returning a promise which is uh, printing this running statement inside the code by the set timeout asynchronous function. Now let's see the async await code. Here is an async function greet. The role of this async keyword is to make the whole method run asynchronously. Okay. What it means is when I will execute this, here is the output then. Then the starting will be printed. Then this delay function will be called with the two, 2000 milliseconds as a parameter. Now because this is an async method, this delay function will not block the code and therefore not blocked will be executed. In the output, you can see that after the start, not block is printed. This is the benefit of the async keyword. It will make your complete method asynchronous. Now the point is, what is the role of the await keyword here? Okay, after printing not blocked, here you can see the await delay function call again. Now this await keyword is required to block the code until this delay method is completed. Okay. So it might be that this delay method is getting some data, which is very important. And that data we might have to print later. That's why listen carefully. We intentionally use await keyword to block or to wait for the response of the delay method. Now in the output, you will see this running statement from inside the delay method. And only then after this block, 
uh, will it be printed and in the output the last statement running is coming from the above delay call of two second which was uh, asynchronous and uh, not blocker right because it did not block anything that's why we completed after it's completed after two seconds which is at the end now finally the definition of async and await keyword is the async keyword is used to define a function as an asynchronous function which means the code inside the async function will not block the execution of the code of other code but 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 at some points inside the async method we want the executions to be in a synchronous manner only therefore at those points we need await keywords the await keyword is used within an async function to pause the execution of the function until a promise is resolved or rejected so that is the whole story about the two brothers whose name are async and await how do you handle errors in async and await functions you already know the answer let's just revise it here you can see the function process data which uses async await and you can see the try catch block inside it then you can see the body of the fetch data function again we are using the try catch and throw statements here so the answer is simple in async await function we can handle errors using the try catch blocks congratulations on completing asynchronous programming sections that was like a milestone in this chapter we will cover questions on browser apis and most importantly web storage we will start with the window object then cover all the browser apis and their methods okay and then we will cover questions on local storage session storage and cookies let's start then what is a window object the answer is simple whenever you open a window in the browser you are basically invoking the window object this is a diagram that will give you some idea about the position of the window object in the browser and as you can see the window object is at the top of the dom bom and javascript itself here bom stands for browser object model dom document object model so in a way you can say it's the topmost uh, parent level object that gets initiated or invoked as soon as you open the browser every browser has this object now here are three points about the window object the window object represents a window in the browser the window object serves as the entry point for interacting with the browser and the last point is it is not the object of the javascript that is a myth okay what are browser apis in javascript as you can see we have many browsers these browsers provide us with some inbuilt functionalities okay those functionalities or apis are called browser apis for example here you can see the list of the browser apis provided by browser okay now each of these apis are a collection of some methods to manage the operation in them and here is the list of the function the first list of methods can be used to create modify or delete dom elements right that is why we call them dom apis then these uh, open send set request header on ready state change methods these required for html http request which is required for ajax calls okay then uh, fetch and then methods are required to fetch data from external apis that's why they call fetch apis then local storage and session storage are used for web storage in the browser and are therefore called storage apis then these are used to maintain the history of the user section in the browser and we call them history api similarly we have methods for the geolocation api to basically to track the location by the browser okay Th these methods are used for that purpose then we have notification apis canvas apis and lastly audio and video apis are though all these are provided by the browser only now you understand what browser apis are right finally the definition is browser apis in javascript are a collection of built-in interfaces and methods provided by the web browsers 
वट इज लोकल स्टोरेज हाउ टू स्टोर रिट्रीव एंड रिमूव डेटा फ्रॉम इट लेट्स ई द डेफिनेशन फर्स्ट लोकल स्टोरेज इज ए वेब स्टोरेज फीचर प्रोवाइडेड बाय द ब्राउजर्स डेट अलाउज वेब एप्लीकेशन टू स्टोर ई वैल्यू पेयर्स ऑफ डाटा लोकली ऑन द यूजर्स डिवाइस नाउ लेट्स ई द कोड टू स्टोर द लोकल स्टोरेज हेयर इज ए वन लाइन कोड यू हैव टू राइट इन योर जावा स्क्रिप्ट फाइल you will get this local storage api from your browser and this api has the set item method that will accept two parameters one is the key and another is the value you can store any key value pairs in local storage and here is the screenshot of the developer tool in the browser under the application tab you will you will find this local storage here okay and the this this key is the key and the value is this value which we just set above right now the question is how you will retrieve the value of this key in your code for that you can use the get item method of the local storage pass the key as the parameter and uh, store that value in this value variable or any other variable now suppose you want to remove a single item from the local storage for that you can use the remove item method of the local storage again by passing the key but if you want to remove all the items local local all the local storage items from your browser for that you can just call the local storage dot clear method no parameter required it will clean and clear all the local storage items from your browser here are all the uses uses of uh, local storage it is used to for storing user preference like language preference or theme preference used to do cache data to improve performance used to implement offline functionality then it is used for storing client side tokens also so mostly in 80% of cases we use local storage uh, in web storage like that is the preferred type of the storage okay only in very few times we use session storage what is the difference between local storage and session storage the first difference is data stored in local storage is accessible across multiple windows tabs and iframes of the same origin okay remember of the same origin uh, same origin means same domain like same website okay so for example you can open facebook and log in in one window but then if you will open another window there you are not required to log in again because your credentials or token is now stored in local storage when you log in the first time okay and now that will be shared with multiple tabs and multiple windows so those credentials in local storage can be used in multiple tabs that is the understanding but for the same website okay not like uh, they do not share between the different websites but the data stored in session storage is specific to a particular browsing session and accessible only within the same window or tab so basically if the developer is storing the credentials in session storage then it will not be shared with the multiple windows the next difference is data stored in local storage persists or is maintained even if you will close the browser even the browser is closed reopened and closed again but data stored in session storage is cleared when a browser window is or the tab is closed so okay so it's automatically clear no code is required for that so if you close the browser then all the session storage data will be automatically deleted the last difference is data stored in local storage has no expiration date whereas the data stored in session storage is temporary and lasts only for the uh, duration of the browsing session so basically these are the differences now you have to decide based on your requirement that uh, you want to uh, store something in the local storage or the session storage so if it is a username credentials local storage are better but if it is a something like form data something which the users filling the form and step by step process or e or some uh, yes, items are added in the e cart those kind of things are, can be stored in session storage
how much data can be stored in a se uh, local storage and session storage now that depends upon the browser most browsers support 5 to 10 mb data per region okay so that is the amount of data you can store in the local or the session storage uh, 5 to 10 mb uh, for example google chrome supports 10 mb per website or region uh, Firefox supports maximum 10 MB, Safari supports uh, 5 MB per origin and Microsoft Edge supports 10 MB. So in short, it is like 5 to 10 MB is the right answer. What are cookies? How to create and read cookies? Okay, so first the definition. Cookies are small pieces of data that are stored in the user's web browser. Okay, now let's explore the code for how to store cookies and how to retrieve their values. Creating a cookie is very simple by just setting up this document.cookie property to like uh, cookie name equal to cookie value. Here we are just assigning, uh, we can assign multiple cookies name to the multiple values like this. So if now you look at the browser developer tool under the application tab, we will find all these cookies items names and values like this. Now the question is how to retrieve the cookies by cookie name. For that, we have to call a get cookie method like this. We have to create this method where basically we are passing the cookie name three as the parameter. And then here is the body of uh, the get cookie method, which we have to create. And inside this document.cookie with will get all the cookies of the website. Okay. And semicolon separate separator. Then we are splitting all the cookies and then iterating them one by one using the for loop and inside if the cookie equal to cookie name which we got from the parameter there then we are returning the specific cookie and getting the output like this in the browser so for cookie name 2 we have the value cookie value 3 in the browser so that was is the whole idea to create and read the cookies not from the interview perspective but now we have an idea that how what is cookie how we create them and how we read them right what is the difference between cookies and web storage the first difference is cookies have a small storage capacity of just up to 4 kb per website or domain and that is the limitation of the cookie also whereas web storage has a large storage capacity of up to 5 to 10 mb per website that is huge as comparison to the cookie right the second difference is cookies are automatically sent with every request so whenever you send any request to the server cookies will automatically be sent without any extra line of code whereas data stored in web storage is not automatically set uh, sent with each request uh, maybe you have to write some code for it then next difference is cookies can have an expiration date set whereas data stored in web storage is not associated associated with an uh, any expiration date the last difference is cookies are accessible both on the client side and the server side this allows uh, server side code to read and modify the cookies values okay whereas web storage is accessible and modifiable only on the client side not on the server side great now you know the differences between them when to use cookies and when to use web storage in real applications in your projects okay so use cookies when uh, if you need to access the stored data on the server side also for example username and password in login forms so when you so that is like you have to keep on exchanging right between the client and the server so uh, for them and uh, use cookies then co use cookies when you want to cross to do cross domain data sharing so between different websites you want to share the data so that is possible through cookies okay so this is the use of the cookies now when to use the web storage then uh, if you need to store large amount of data then web storage is the better choice because cookies data storage is very limited or for a simpler and more efficient way to store and retrieve data because uh, that is uh, more efficient storing and retrieving data in web storage is more efficient than cookies okay cookies you know you have to write a big method and then you have to iterate so that is slightly complex all right 
तो द कंक्लूजन इज मोस्टली वी यूज वेब स्टोरेज ओनली बट यस समाइम्स कुकीज आर द राइट चॉइस ओके कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन ऑन कंप्लीटिंग द लास्ट सेक्शन ऑफ ब्राउजर ए पी आईज एंड हेयर इज ए स्मॉल सेक्शन ऑन क्लासेस कंस्ट्रक्टर्स दिस की वर्ड रोल एंड इनहेरिटेंस इट इज़ ए वेरी स्मॉल चैप्टर सो इट इज़ नॉट गोइंग टू टेक मच टाइम वट आर क्लासेस इन जावा स्क्रिप्ट क्लासेस आर मोर पॉपुलर इन सर्वर साइड लैंग्वेज लाइक जावा एंड शी शार्प बट बिकॉज दे प्रोवाइड सो मैनी बेनिफिट्स सो देयर यूसेज इज इंक्रीजिंग इन फ्रंट एंड टेक्नोलॉजीज ऑल्सो लाइक जावा स्क्रिप्ट नाउ वट इज द रीजन इज दैट क्लासेस गिव ऑब्जेक्ट ओरिएंटेड स्ट्रक्चर्ड कोड विच इज ए वेरी गुड फॉर वेरी लार्ज एंड एंटरप्राइज लेवल बिग एप्लीकेशन ओके लेट सी द कोड हेयर यू कैन सी ए पीस ऑफ कोड वेयर पर्सन इज ए क्लास एंड इन साइड डैट वी हैव ए कंस्ट्रक्टर एंड ए फंक्शन नाउ द क्वेश्चन इज हाउ डू वी यूज दिस क्लास फॉर डैट वी हैव टू क्रिएट द ऑब्जेक्ट फ्रॉम दिस क्लास लाइक दिस Here you can see we are using the new keyword with the class name person and passing two parameters name and age. Here this object creation code will invoke the class constructor method automatically, and the constructor will receive this age and name as the parameters. Then the constructor will set the properties of this person object here name and age, and finally the object of uh, person class is created. which is then assigned to the variable person 1 the same will happen with the second object also so now in our javascript applications we have two object one is person 1 another is person 2 and we can access the properties of the object something like this person dot name and even we can call the methods of the class by object dot method name and we will get the expected output now you will ask uh, what is the benefit of this class right why can't we directly create this person object right good question and uh, the benefit is reusability so you can you can create this class at one place and then you can create multiple objects of this class anywhere in the in your application for example uh, you can create multiple objects of this person class like uh, happy anurag multiple person man woman multiple objects right uh, finally the definition of classes classes serves as the blueprint for creating the objects and define their structure and behavior right and here are some advantage of, of classes the first obvious obvious one is that classes are used for object creation the second benefit is uh, classes follow object oriented principles which provide encapsulation which then provide the data safety uh, then object oriented programming also provides inheritance which in uh, inheritance what inheritance provide it provides reusability another benefit of uh, object oriented programming is polymorphism and abstraction so that is a very deep level discussion but maybe i will cover this in some separate question what is a constructor here is the code of a simple class person and inside this we can see the constructor keyword right the constructor is nothing but a function remember it's just a function of the class that is invoked automatically whenever you create any object of this person class and then the logic inside the constructor will be executed so if you want some code to be executed automatically whenever an object of this class is created then simply put that logic or code inside the constructor okay finally the definition is constructors are special methods within the class that are automatically called when an object is created of the class using the new keyword that's it what are constructor functions we already know we can have constructor constructor inside the class like this but suppose you do not want any methods like say hello to be there inside the class okay you do not want any method okay so either you should remove the method from the class okay or instead instead of creating a class you can just create a constructor function like this the difference is here you cannot put any function inside the constructor function okay so this will work the same uh, same as a class work which uh, does not have a function okay 
and the way of creating the object will remain the same. The definition is constructor functions are a way of creating objects and initializing the their properties. What is the use of this keyword? The definition is this keyword pro provides a way to access the current object or class. For example, suppose you have a class uh, uh, like this. Now inside the see the constructor having uh, this uh, this dot name equal to name. Here name is the value you are getting from the parameter name. Okay, and this dot name what it is? It is referring to the property of the person class. So basically, we use this uh, this keyword here to represent the class uh, which uh, which name is person. So see the definition again. This keyword provides a way to access the current object or the class. And here we are accessing the class. Similarly, in the constructor function, you can also use this keyword with the property names like this. Now the question is, what is the benefit of using uh, this, this keyword here? Uh, the benefit is, for example, if you do not use this keyword, this keyword here with this class person, okay? Then tell me how will you differentiate which one is the parameter and which one is the property of the class. So you cannot differentiate them, right? That will create the confusion. So same thing with the constructor function also. You cannot differentiate. So, so this keyword is used to represent the current object or class and to avoid any confusion. That is the answer of this question. Explain the concept of prototypal inheritance. Let's understand the code first. Suppose we have an object vehicle like this. The prop type is a property and its value is a car. So vehicle is of type car. And then this drive function, which is just printing one line here, driving. Now we can use this parent object to create a new child object using the object.create method like this. You can see we are now uh, creating a BMW object by using the vehicle object. This object.create method accepts a parent object as the parameter and the child object BMW will be created. So this is called a prototypal inheritance. Here the child object will inherit or acquire all the properties of the parent object automatically. If you will log the type of the, for example, log the type of the BMW object like this, then the result will be car, which is coming from the parent vehicle object. Okay, because there you have nothing you have done inside the BMW setting the type you have not done. And then you can call the parent class function from the child object. Oh, that is also possible. So the benefit is you can keep common all the common properties and function in a base class like a car like this and through prototypal uh, in inheritance you can then create other objects like mercedes tesla toyota etc because all these objects will have the same type car right and the same drive method so maybe they have some different properties like bmw car uh, might have a red color so you can keep those changeable properties or function inside the child class object, not in the parent class and the common functionalities and properties in the parent class. So that is the benefit of the prototypal inheritance, the reusability of the code. Finally, the definition is prototypal inheritance allows object to inherit properties and methods from the parent ob objects. That is the answer of this question. Great, you have already covered 80% of the course and that shows your dedication. In this chapter number 18, we will cover questions on Akamai script and modules. Here is the list of 7 questions. We will start with the basics of ES6 and then we will check out some questions on modules in JavaScripts. So let's start with the first question. What is ES6? What are the new features introduced by it? ECMAScript, which is ES6, is the standard that JavaScript follows. Uh, you can think of ECMAScript as a company and whatever concepts it introduces for JavaScript, then all the browsers like Chrome, Edge, Firefox, 
they have to introduce or integrate those APIs and function functionalities into their JavaScript engines. So it is like the top level for the JavaScript, like um, e ESX. Okay. Now here are the popular features that uh, ESX introduced in JavaScript: uh, const keywords, then let and const keywords, arrow functions, classes, template literals, destructuring assignment default parameters rest and spread operators promises modules all these i explained in my previous questions so basically the this is uh, es6 is the standard for the javascript what are modules in javascript very simple rather than writing the whole javascript code in one single file either main.js or index.js create more javascript files for example, create the JavaScript file display.js for all the display related functionalities functions in your application and then import this display.js uh, to the main.js file. Okay, all those functions import them. In this manner, your application will be more structured and readable for the developers. Also, one file can be used in many modules like main.js and other other. So that is one of the benefit of modules. The definition is modules in JavaScript are a way to organize the code into separate files, making it easier to manage and then reu reuse the code across different parts, parts of the application. Now let's see the code quickly. Uh, suppose you have this uh, HTML on your web page. Here you are putting the source as an index.js file, which is the JavaScript file. But here, as you can see, we have this type equal to module. What does that mean? It means index.js file is a module also. So if you will see the code of uh, the index.js file, here you can see that we have these import statements, import statements for add, subtract and multiply methods from different JavaScript files. And then down here, we are calling these methods. But where are the declaration and body of these functions? These methods are not in this index.js file. These method bodies are in other files. For example, add method is here in the add.js file, subtract method in the subtract.js file, multiply in multiply.js file. The point is in big application, there can be many functions like this. So writing all functions in one JavaScript file is not a good practice. That's why we can have different JavaScript files for a better structure of the application. And then we can import those methods by using the import statement in various JavaScript file wherever the functions are required. This will provide what? Code reusability. That is module and now you know the purpose of them. What is the role of the export keyword? If you have a method in JavaScript and we are putting export in front of the function, only then this function will be available outside of this class for import. Got it? So basically then in the index.js file, we will be able to import the add method from the add.js file like this. But if you remove this export keyword, then this import statement will not work as the add method will not be available for the import because it uh, does not have that uh, export keyword so whole point is the export keyword allows you to specify functions for use in ex other external modules that is the answer of this question what are the advantages of modules the most important advantage is code reusability you will write a method in one JavaScript or class and then you can import that method into multiple uh, JavaScript files. Okay. Other benefit is uh, code organization. Then uh, next benefit is improved co maintainability of code because uh, the more you will divide the code, then it is better to if there is any bug or error, then it is better to, you know, check out the only the particular module rather than if the all the code is mixed in a single, then you it's very difficult to maintain that. The next benefit is performance opt optimization via lazy loading. And the last one is 
encapsulation via an independent and self-contained unit so if you will remember the top two three advantages that are enough that's it what is the difference between named exports and default exports imagine you have this math.js file with two functions add and subtract now you are exporting both of them to import them in this main.js file like this this is called what this is named exports the point is named exports allows you to export multiple functions from a module this is the normal way right you already know this now let's explore the default export uh, if you have this utility.js file with this function greet here here you can see this default keyword now when you will import the greet function in another module like this it will only be able to import single function only not multiple right so that means default ex default export allows you to export a single element as the default export from a module not the multiples and that is the answer what is the difference between static and dynamic imports very good question static imports are normal imports like this uh, this is also called a static imports definition static imports are typically uh, placed at the top of the file and cannot be conditionally or dynamically determined uh, what is uh, what does it mean uh, so, so that is dynamic so if you see the code of the dynamic import here then in dynamic import you will import the method exactly at the place where it is needed for example here you have imported math.js just before this then function and then here we are directly using the add method without like importing them at the top like we do it for static imports right above we were importing add method from the math.js at the top so this kind of import is called dynamic import because it is called whenever it is needed if it is not needed we are not going to place them anywhere the conclusion is dynamic imports can be called conditionally or within function based on the runtime logic allowing it uh, its more flexibility in module loading and uh, now you know what is a static import and what is dynamic import right what are module bundlers all right here you can see one diagram whenever any request come to comes to the server the server bundles all the js uh, javascript css and images files uh, together in a module bundler okay normally we call it a bundle and uh, this bundle is sent as the response to the client request so that is the process this process of making the bu this bundle is called what module bundling the bundling is required to make the response lightweight by removing the white spaces and other unnecessary things from the different files okay so that is why module bundling is important the definition is module bundlers in javascripts are tools that combine multiple modules or files into a single optimized bundle that can be uh, sent or executed by the web browser now here are the most popular module bundlers tools which basically bundle all the files together the javascript image uh, to optimize it okay so tools are webpack rollup parcel browserify required js uh, these tools normally uh, us developers create uh, use these tools to create the bundles uh, now i think you got it completely right congratulations on completing the last chapter every web application now has some security and performance issues right and in this section we will explore those security issues and what steps we can take to prevent them okay so let's start analyzing them what is eval function in javascript eval is a built-in javascript function that evaluates a string as javascript code and dynamically executes it what does it mean for example suppose you have this code now you can see x plus y is a string but if you pass this code variable as a parameter inside the eval function like this then then the eval function will consider this as a real code and it will try to evaluate it dynamically and here you can see the output which is the addition of x and y that means the eval function is evaluating the javascript string dynamically at runtime 
that is the short story about the evil what is x double s cross site scripting attack imagine you have one input element and a submit button on or on or your your web page for your users now one of the user is a hacker and he will put some script code inside this in, uh, inside the input element and then he will press the submit button if you see this script code this is a malicious script that can change the behavior of the execution okay this might give the hacker details about all the cookies of your application so this is what we call call a cross site scripting attack the definition is XSS which stands for cross site scripting is a security attack when a user or hackers insert some malicious script code in the input fields to steal or manipulate the content of your website that's the answer what is a sql injection attack imagine you are a developer and you have created one web page with an input element and a submit button now one hacker or user will just put this sql script inside this in the uh, input element and click submit you can see this is a valid sql script for getting the results so if you do not validate the in input uh, as a developer then this execution can show the result of this sql query to the hacker that is dangerous right your data is exposed the point is sql injection is a security attack when a user or hacker inserts some malicious sql script in the input fields to steal or manipulate the content of your website that is sql injection what are some best practices for security in javascript here are best practices for implementing security in javascript first is input validation always validate and sanitize user input to prevent xls and sql injection attacks okay do not let the user to submit any invalid data validate the input first the second practice is avoid the use of eval uh, avoid using eval to execute the dynamic code because it can introduce some security ris risk by executing untrusted code right some string string is converting into the dynamic code which can be dangerous right the next best practice is secure communication always use https not http for secure communication the next best practice is authentication and authorization always use a strong password hashing algorithms as a developer i never allowed the users to use short and easy passwords that should be a practice because that can be easily hacked right so there are many more best practices but these are like the most basic ones what are the best practices for improving performance in javascript here are some best practices for improving performance first is minimize http request combine and minify the javascript files into a single file to reduce the number of http requests okay for example use module bundlers to uh, minify the ja files of the javascript html images so use module bundlers second is use asynchronous operations utilize callbacks promises or async await to perform asynchronous operation and avoid blocking the main code main thread okay third practice is to minimize dom manipulation continuously manipulating dom is a very time consuming process so minimize it it as much as possible it is not possible that you will completely remove it because it is necessary but yes try to minimize the dom manipulation next best practice is avoid memory leaks for that remove the event listeners when events are no more required okay so that otherwise they will just occupying the memory in your javascript engine and then that too is like if uh, um, impact the performance right next is cache data store frequently used data in memory or web storage to make the application fast and responsive next best practice is use lazy loading use lazy loading technique to load the resources only when they are needed 
this will improve the initial page load time of your website okay last but not the least is optimizing images the more images on your website the long longer it will take to download right so compress them or optimize them to download fa download faster so these were some of the techniques to improve the performance in javascript based web applications congratulations you have almost completed the course if the interviewer asks you straightforward question like what is set timeout what is set interval you can easily answer them but what if the interviewer asks you the same questions in an indirect way for example this first question how do i execute a piece of code repeatedly after uh, a fixed interval of time fixed time basically so this is simple and same but sometimes we are stuck in these kinds of questions also all right so here are 20 questions that have mostly one word answer these are the first 10 and then we have 10 more so here is some advice for you also just before i started answering the question try to pause and think about the answer yourself okay so got it so let's start with the first question how to execute a piece of code repeatedly after some fixed time good question this is possible by using the set interval function of javascript here is the piece of code where you can use uh, see that inside uh, the set interval method we are passing two parameters the first parameter is the code and the second parameter is the time this means that interval method will execute the code in first parameter in every one second repeatedly again and again that is the answer how to handle asynchronous operations in javascript simple by using promises or async await mechanism here is a sample code for async await this is just the sample high level code not the complete one okay how to manipulate and modify the css styles of html elements dynamically again think for a second the answer is by using the dom manipulation method style.set property here is the code sample where you can see the first we are getting the reference of, of this my element in the element variable and then we are using the set property method of the style property of the element to set this the color of this uh, color property of the element to read okay so that's the answer short and simple how to handle errors and executions in your code the answer is by using the try catch statement yes here is the sample code for the try catch and you can see that you can put the whole logic inside the try block if there is any error inside the try block then that error will be sent to the catch block with the error message that is the short answer of this question how to store key value pairs and efficiently access and manipulate the data for key value pairs the best way is to use either objects or maps for example here is a person object and you can see it can store both the key and the value now in order to access the value you can use the dot notation to access the value of the key like this person dot name and if you want to manipulate the value of the existing property then just assign a new value to the property and the, that's enough how to iterate over elements in an array and perform a specific operation on each element answer is by using array methods like for each map or for off loop suppose you have an array number like this now you can use the for each method here and inside the method you can pass each number one by one as the parameter and use the arrow, oper arrow operator to modify each element like this and just logged it final output is like two four six eight ten each element is modified right but remember this will not modify the original array we have just performed some operation on each element and locked them that's it how to dynamically add or remove elements from a web page the answer is by using the dom manipula manipulation methods like create element append child or remove child for example in this code we first create a new new, new div element by using the create element method then we are assigning the text con content of the div element to hello world 
finally when the element is ready we add this new element to the dom by using what append child method of the dom body okay uh, that was, was for adding a new element for removing the element we can just use the remove child method of the dom like this which will remove the element what method is used to retrieve data from an external api the answer is we can retrieve data from external api by using the fetch api method if you see the code here then we are passing the url of the api as a parameter inside the fetch method now if we receive the proper success response then this then function will be log the uh, log the response data or but if we receive the error then this catch function will log the error that's the answer how do you manage the state in a web application maintaining a state just by vanilla or plain javascript is very hard therefore we manage state by using state management libraries like redux mobex or javascript frameworks like react angular and vue.js how to implement a queue or a stack like data structure in javascript the answer is by using arrays which can be used to implement queues and stacks in javascript for example this is the sample code for the array queue and you can see how we are pushing the items one by one inside this queue right and then we are also shifting which means deleting the items from this queue array so that is one way to implement the queue or a stack like data structure in javascript how do you attach an event handler to an html element one word answer and you know it this is the code to do it here this add event listener method is used to attach an event hand event handler to an html element very short answer that's it how to perform actions based on keyboard events in javascript the answer is by using event listeners for keyboard events like these uh, key down key up and key press events these are events right for example here is the code where we are adding the event listener to the key down event so if the user will press enter then this statement will be logged how to fetch data from multiple apis in parallel and and process the results together the answer is by using the promise.all method in asynchronous programming here you can see one sample code where we are using the promise.all method to fetch the results from the multiple multiple apis right what are the methods to manipulate json data efficiently the answer is by using json.parse and json.stringify methods as you can see we have some json data here which is converted into an object by using this json.parse method that is the answer of this question how can you get the current url of a web page the word one, one word answer is by using the window.location.href that will give the current url of the web page in javascript here is a short question how do you find the length of an array in javascript here we have an array and if we you, you use uh, this array it has a length property okay this property will get the number of the elements in the array which is 5 in this case the answer is the length properties returns the number of elements in the array and that's the way to count the number of the elements in the array that's it how to create a copy of an array there are many ways to copy an array but i think the simplest one is the slice method of the array like this just use this methods without any arguments and you will get a new copied uh, array from the original array how do you access individual characters in a string suppose you have a string like this and you want to access some characters of it then the first way is to use the bracket notation index of zero like this here zero is the index of h so we will uh, receive it in the first care variable okay another way is to use the care at method of the string which will accept the index as the parameter two is the index of the third character of the uh, uh, string which is l and it will be logged as the output the point is we can access individual characters by using bracket notation or the care at method how can you check if a string contains a specific substring for example 
this is the code and we have to check whether this hello world will contain this substring world world or not for that we have these three ways to do it the first way is to use the includes method so we will call the includes method of the string like this and pass the substring as the parameter which will return true or false in this case it is true then in the index of method we will find the index of that substring first and if the substring exists in the main string then the value returned by the index of method will be greater than or equal to zero because it exists right if uh, it does not exist then the value will be minus one uh, in this case index of world which exists will uh, be around 10 or 11 so which is greater than zero so it will again return true then the last approach is using regular expression uh, which will basically use patterns we have to set the pattern and then we can use the test method of the pattern string it will find the pattern in the whole string in it and return true because uh, world exists uh, exists in hello world right so all right these were the three ways to do it can you modify the value of a variable captured in a closure very simple question if you see the code by calling closure one again and again we are only modifying the values of the count variable only okay so the answer is yes when a closure captures a variable from the outer scopes it retains a reference to the variable this reference allows the closure to access and modify the variable even if the outer function has finished executing that's the short answer congratulations on completing the second last section of this course and this is the last section of this course before starting i appreciate your dedication and that is all we needed for achieving our goals right now these days coding questions are very popular for any software development role right so here are the top 21 coding questions for you my advice is to first try them by yourself and then check out the answer later so let's start with the first question write a function that returns the reverse of a string very important question for example you have this string interview happy now you want to create the function reverse string which will give output as the reverse of the string okay like this this is a very com common question and every developer should know it i will tell you two ways of doing it first is by using the for loop for that first we have to initialize an empty string to store the reversed string and then we can use the for loop to iterate through the characters of the input string in reverse order okay so here we will set i as the last index of the string and then moving in reverse order we will go till the i is greater than equal to zero the index and continuously decrementing it then we are simply putting the characters from the last element of the string one by one in the new reversed string so this is one way of doing it but there is one shortcut and very smart way to do it also that is by using javascript inbuilt functions okay here first we split the string into an array of characters by using the split method then we reverse the order of the elements in the array by using the reverse method and at the last we again join the characters back together into a single string by using the join method and this one line of code will give you the expected result as an output going forward in most of the question you can solve the problem in two ways either you can use the for loop and the if else condition with very long code or you can use the javascript in built methods to write the code with shorter syntax okay both are correct but if you know the javascript function very well then use them as much as possible write a function that returns the longest word in the sentence for example you have this sentence and now you have to create a function called find a longest word which will find the longest word in this sentence here you can see javascript is the longest word in the sentence right so you want javascript as the output 
Now for this, first declare the function and pass the sentence as the parameter. The first step is to split the sentence into an array of words by using the split method. And space will be the delimiter here, okay, the separator. Then you can just initialize one empty variable, a uh, longest word. In this kind of question, uh, always remember one thing. Whatever the output is, first always initialize a variable with an empty value or some value that later you can set the expected output in that variable okay so like that is the way of do, solving this kind of questions declaring a variable first uh, coming back to the question now we will use the for of loop to iterate over all the words uh, elements of the array of the words ju ju that just you created as a next step we have to check if the word length is uh, longer than the current wo longest word length and in first iteration, the length of the word i is 1, which is longer than the longest word, which is empty because. So, we will assign the longest word equal to word and word is i, right? So, now the longest word is i. Then on the second iteration, the longest word i will be compared with the next word love, right? And again, since the love length is longer than i, so now the longest word will be love. Like this, we will keep on comparing, comparing, and finally we will get the longest word as the JavaScript. And uh, if you will compare any word with JavaScript in this sentence, that is uh, uh, shorter, right? That will be shorter, right? And that is the solution of, for this coding problem. Write a function that checks whether a given string is a palindrome or not. Very good question. First of all, what is palindrome, right? First, we should know. So, a palindrome is a word that reads the same forward and backward. For example, if this race car is the word and if you reverse the characters of the word, then the race, the, this word will remain same, right? Therefore, race, cars, race car is a palindrome and the output will be true because it is a palindrome. Now, for this, first we have to create this function is palindrome. Inside it, first we will pass the string as the parameter and then we will reverse this string. Okay, so we know how to reverse the string, right? Uh, split the method to break the string into characters. Then we have to reverse the order of the array and then we have to join back all the characters of the array to get the reverse string. So once we get the reverse string, it's very easy. As a next step, just compare the reverse string with the original string by using the equality operator so that is the logic and it will return true or false right in this particular case it will return true and that is our expected output if it is not equal then this condition will return what false that is the solution of this question write a function to remove duplicate elements from an array for example suppose you have an array like this and here you have duplicate elements right 4 and 6 now you have to create the remove duplicate function to remove this uh, duplicate elements the output should be something like this and i will show you two ways of doing this first is the traditional way of using the for loop and you you will pass the array as the parameter in the function for this first and then create one empty array unique elements to store the unique elements okay then you will lose the loop uh, through all the existing ele elements of the uh, parameter one array parameter array one by one now inside the for loop you will check in the new unique elements array if the index of the current element is equal to minus one or not for example in the first iteration i equal to zero and therefore uh, this array zero is the first element of the array which is one right so right now our unique ele element list is blank uh, there is no element inside it so the index of the element one in unique element array will be minus one okay uh, whenever a, an element is not present in an array that's index uh, is minus one right therefore this if condition will be true and one will be pushed into the unique elements array by using this push method similarly two three or will also be inserted in this unique elements array because they are already not present there they are not there right and their index will be minus one 
नाउ आवर यूनिक एलिमेंट एरे कंटेन्स एलिमेंट्स वन टू थ्री फोर बट नाउ वेन द लूप गेट्स दिस फिफ्थ एलिमेंट विच इज फोर देन दिस यूनिक एलिमेंट इंडेक्स ऑफ फोर विल बी इक्वल टू थ्री बिकॉज वी ऑलरेडी हैव फोर एट द थर्ड इंडेक्स ऑफ द यूनिक एलिमेंट एरे राइट देर फोर दिस इफ कंडीशन विल बी फॉल्स एंड द पुश इन साइड द इफ ब्लॉक विल नॉट एग्जीक्यूट ओके बिकॉज दिस विल नॉट एग्जीक्यूट देन सेकेंड फोर विल नॉट सो दिस फोर विल बिल नॉट बी एडेड इन द यूनिक एलिमेंट्स द सेम विल हैपन विद द लास्ट एलिमेंट सिक्स सेम सिचुएशन एंड फाइनली वी विल गेट एन एरे ऑफ यूनिक एलिमेंट्स ओनली दैट इज द वन वे एंड इज द लॉन्ग वे ऑफ डूइंग कोडिंग इट नाउ देर इज ए अनदर शॉर्टकट वे एंड दैट इज बाय यूजिंग द सेट ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ द जावा स्क्रिप्ट ए सेट इज ए कलेक्शन ऑफ वर्ट यू नो यूनिक एलिमेंट्स दैट इज नॉट एन एरे and it is different uh, object in the javascript okay it's a different object here you will pass an array inside the set method now set will only keep the unique elements inside it and will remove the duplicate elements and then you will use the spread operator with the new keyword to convert this set back into the array okay so this spread operator basically it will uh, spread all the element first and then You, this new keyword uh, with this brackets will make it an array so because we need the array as the output right so that we will get as expected uh one thing you noticed here that javascript has many built in functions and objects that will make the development shorter and simpler so if you have the knowledge of those functions then it is going to be a bit simple for you to solve these kinds of problems write a function that checks whether two two strings are anagrams or not sorry for the pronunciation it's anagrams right anagrams uh, so this question is asked in many interviews first of all we should know what is anagram and an anagram is a word formed by the rearranging the letters of another word uh, suppose you have these two words listen and silent right now you can closely observe and by uh, you can see by rearranging the letters of the this word listen you can get the silent okay by using the same letters of this word right that means they are anagrams okay so the output of this anagram should be true okay so how to solve it for this first we have to create uh, this r anagrams function and pass both the string as as the parameters then as a next step we have to first split the string into an array of characters by using the split method then sort the characters of the array by using the sort method by default the sorting is in ascending order okay then join the characters again by using the join method simple the output will be something like this e i l n s t in ascending order okay now the same thing we have to do with the second string also and we will get the same ascending order string right got it now we can use just use the equality operator to check if both the sorted string are same or not if both sorted strings are same then like they are anagrams right therefore return true otherwise if not same then return false and that is the solution again if you know the basic javascript methods split sort so join filter concat etc then these programs are going to be very simple for you write a function that returns the number of vowels in a string so you know vowels right for example this is a string hello world and we have to write this method count vowels to count the number of the vowels uh, in this string so here in hello world i o o three vowels are there so the count the expected output is 3 for this first we have to declare uh, the method and pass the string as the parameter okay the hello world then first we will declare an array of vowels okay we should know like what are the vowels uh, in the program uh, to identify the vowels and then we will set the initial value count to equal to 0 because as i said earlier first we have to set the expected expected output as the variable okay count equal to 0 now we will change this count uh, by the logic so then we will iterate through each character in this string by using the for loop here you we will check if the character is a vowel for example 
if first letter of hello world is h then in the array of vowels we will check the existence of h care h care by using this includes method so if h is not there in this vowel array uh, which it is not so this condition will be false and no increment will be happened to the count but for the next letter e of the string e is there in the array of vowels because it is a vowel so the count will be incremented from 0 to 1 this time next time for both third o and again for o the count will be incremented again and we will get the final count value equal to 3 and that is the expected output right and that is the solution of this problem write a function to find the largest number in an array for example this is an array of five numbers and we have to write the method find largest number to get the largest number out of this array uh, the output should be nine you know like by saying it we, you know but we have to create the program so first we will create the method and here we will assume that the first element of the array is the largest element we will start from here okay we, we will set it to this largest variable and now the largest element is to the first element now inside the for loop we will start from the index i equal to 1 why not uh, started from 0 because uh, element at index 0 is already the largest we assumed it right now we will start iterating over all the elements of the array inside we keep comparing those elements with the current largest element for example first we will compare the current element at index 1 which is 4 with the largest 2 uh, if the current element 4 is greater than uh, this largest element 2 which it is yes then we will assign the current element to the largest element so the largest element will be 4 now then we will do the next iteration and the comparison and this we will uh, do and do and uh, get the like the first 4 will be the then 6 uh, is greater and at last we will get the 9 but after 9 the next element is 3 and 3 is not greater than the largest number 9 now so this if condition will be false and the largest element will remain what 9 okay and that is the expected output write a function to check if a given number is prime or not good question by great teacher <laughs> so we know the prime numbers right uh, a number which is only divisible by 1 and itself for example 7 is the prime number so we should get the output for 7 as true but uh, 10 is not a prime number it can be divided by 2 and 5 so the output uh, should be false uh, for 10 now to code this first create this is prime method and pass the number as the parameter uh, then use the for loop to iterate from 2 to the given number divided by 2 why we are starting from 2 because we have to ignore division by one because we know uh, every number is divided is divisible by one and uh, that that is the not the prime condition right uh, prime numbers are also divided by one now for example if 10 is the number then you have to start from 2 and you have to go to what 10 divided by 2 equals to 5 so 2 to 5 i give the reason gave the reason for 2 but why 5 is the last of uh, number because any number can be divided by maximum the number that is the maximum half of that for example 10 will never be divided by a number which is greater than 5 right like 6 7 8 9 it will never be divided by those number so that is like the optimization even if you will go to the uh, here the 10 like uh, that will also work but then you are doing more iteration just wasting like right so better to optimize now second step check the reminder of the number divided by 2 uh, this percentile operator is what reminder 10 divided by 2 the reminder will be 0 so then return false because then 10 is not a prime number but if the number is 7 then you start from 2 7 percentile 2 reminder will be equal to 1 uh, which is uh, yes so then 7 divided by 3 reminder again equal to 1 so if this con if condition is always false for every iteration therefore at the end true will be returned okay right so which means the number is a prime number write a function to calculate the factorial of a number 
here you can see we have 5 as a number and we want to create a, a function factorial the factorial of a number is to multiply the number with all previous numbers from 1 to that number itself for example for 5 the result will be the multiplication of 1 2 3 4 and 5 which will be equal to 120 that is the expected output for this first we will create the function and pass the uh, number as the parameter as always then first we we must handle the edge case because what is edge case be, uh, exception case also you can say because the factorial of zero will be always one okay so uh, that is the edge case we cannot uh, you know code for it that is simply a constant thing then we will first initialize the factorial variable with this value one now we will use the for loop to multiply the start uh, multiply the numbers starting from 1 to the number itself for calculating the factorial of number 5 start from 1 and then uh, first factorial 1 multiplied by 1 equal to 1 then i equal to 2 so i multiplied by 2 equal to 2 then and 3 uh, i equal to 3 so 2 multiplied by 3 factorial equal to 6 6 multiplied by 4 factorial equal to 24 and 24 multiplied by 25 equal to 120 the factorial will be and that is the expected result of a factorial program right that is the answer of this question write a program to remove all the white spaces characters from a string for example this is the string you have and you have to create one method to remove all the white spaces from this string output should be something like this a word with no spaces white space means in the spaces only for this First, create the method and pass the string as the parameter. There are now two ways of doing it. First, use the for loop, and I leave it to you to use the for loop to just remove the white spaces. I know you can do it, right? That is very much similar to previous questions where we used for loop, right? Now, the second is the shortcut way, and it is something like using a regular expression. Here we have to use this slash s to find the spaces, tabs, and line breaks. Okay, this slash s will resemble spaces, tabs, and line breaks. And this g flag is used to do the global search. So, which means it will search the slash s, the spaces, tab, and line breaks all over the string. So, this g uh, re is responsible for searching. Okay, at last. Just use the replace method to replace all the occurrences of slash s matches with this empty string. And finally, you will get a string that does not have any spaces, line breaks, or tabs. So that is how we have used the regular expression this time to solve this problem. Uh, if uh, because that is a kind of a smart way. So if you know the for loop, that is also good. But this is like a you know. Uh, one point extra answer write a function to find the sum of all the elements in an array for example this is the array we have and we have to sum all of the elements very simple right the output should be 15 in this case first we will create the find sum method and pass the array as the parameter and then we will first initialize the sum variable to zero okay that is the minimum possible sum right and in the second step, we will iterate all the elements in the array and add each element to the sum one by one. The sum value will be keep changing and you will get the desired sum value uh, when the loop is completed. That is the simple solution for this question. Write a function to find the average of an array of numbers. For example, this is an array of numbers and we have to find the average of all of them. In this case, you know the output will be 3. For this, first we will calculate the sum, right, of all the elements by using the for loop that we, you already know. Then we will divide the sum by using this array.length uh, means, uh, what it means is the, the number of elements in the array. And this will give us the average of the array. That is the simple answer of this question. Write a function to sort an array of numbers in ascending order very important question and very tricky also for example we have an array of numbers like this now we have to create the method that will give the output as the sorted array in ascending order in this case output should be like this 
now maybe you will say that we will directly use the sort method okay just and that's it but uh, that is uh, wrong actually so now remember that by default the sort function sort values as a strings not numbers okay so if you use the blank or empty uh, sort method with numbers array it will produce the incorrect output you can try it okay so let me explain what what is this a minus b logic then which we will put with the sort method here here the a and b parameters uh, will be start from the first two elements of the array in this case first a is 10 and b is 1 a minus b uh, will be 10 minus 1 equal to 9 which is positive if positive then the element position will be swapped swapped okay now the array will, will be like uh, 1 and 10 so both elements are swapped 1 10 20 2 5 this is the new array then these a and b will be the next consecutive elements which are 10 and 20 now a minus b 10 minus 20 equal to minus 10 which is negative therefore this time no swapping so elements will remain same at their present position then next 20 minus 2 equal to 18 positive so swap swapping will happen new array will be 1 10 2 20 and 5 now 20 minus 5 swapping again 1 10 2 5 5 and 20 so you can see we got the highest number 20 at the end uh, from the first iteration then again the same a minus b iteration will happen for the first four numbers only because last element is fixed fifth element is fixed which is 20 now we have to uh, uh, sort the first four elements and the second uh, highest number will be set at the fourth place because of that then again we will do uh, the sort method will uh, you know do it for the first three numbers and then for the first two numbers so internally this sort function will iterate for four iterations like this okay and you are getting the expected output by writing just one line of code like this sort okay so that is the beauty of the javascript inbuilt functions you uh, you can also use the for loops for this multiple lines of code you can understand how many lines of code and the conditions you have to put if this swap uh, so swapping also you should know how to swap two numbers and so all this is done by this sort a minus b okay now i hope you got it write a function to check if a given array is sorted in ascending order or not okay think 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 okay now let's start for example suppose you have this array now you have to check whether it is sorted or not uh, in this ca case the output will be true right because this is sorted uh, for this again we will create one function is sorted and pass the array as the parameter that is always we have we are we have to do then first we will iterate through the array starting with the second element because inside we are comparing the current element with the previous element if you can see here uh, okay so we will start by comparing the second element with the first element now the element uh, at index 1 is 2 which is greater than the index at uh, 0 index element which is 1 so the condition is false then we will compare element number 3 with 2 again 2 is not greater than 3 therefore if condition is false again and like this if we we, we will continue this we will if we will find any element that is greater than its next element what does that mean then this if condition becomes true and it will return the false from inside right which means the array is a not the sorted array okay if any element is greater than its next element so that is the criteria so every time the element must be greater than its previous element but should not be greater than its next element so that means the array is sorted and that is the solution of this question write a function to merge two arrays into a single sorted array okay so if you know how to merge if you know how to sort you know the answer suppose we have two arrays like this now we have to merge these arrays and sort them in a single array so first uh, this should be the sorted list expected output okay 
first we will create the function we which you will expect uh, except to do arrays as the parameters then first step is to concatenate the two arrays into a single array by using the concat method now we have one single array right merged array now we can sort this array by using the sort function of arrays okay how this a minus b logic work that i already explained in the previous question and don't ask me again expect me to explain again so basically that is what is the purpose of uh, you know step by step learning <laughs> if you will miss the previous step then going to next step uh, you will think that why uh, you know why this is happening so uh, and you will then try to mug up things which is very bad so basically yes you already know it i know that's the solution of this question right simple and easy write a function to remove a specific element from an array for example you have this array of elements and you want to remove this target element too from the array and the output should be something like this after removing right for that we will create one function and pass the original array and the target element uh, to be removed like this now inside this we will use the array dot filter method which will basically accept all the elements of the array in the parameter one by one then we will be checking whether each array element is not equal to this target removal element too so if both are not equal then this condition will be true and the element will be added to the filtered array which is completely fine but if some array element is equal to the target removal element which is 2 this then this condition will be false and that element will be skipped and will not be added to the filtered array list and that is how this new filtered array will contain only numbers other than the target element 2 okay that is the solution uh, i forgot but instead of using function here you can also try the arrow function like this is the named function but better to use the arrow operator or arrow function then your code will be shorter okay and the result will be also same and i hope you know the filter method which basically again it's i already so basically filter method uh, will add only items which for which this condition is true a very short definition okay this condition will be true then all those elements uh, will be added in the filtered uh, list write a function to find the second largest element in an array so this is an array in front of you and we need the second largest element and which is 8 here so that is the expected output for that first we will use the for loop and that is a long way okay i'm going to tell you the short way you can try the for loop i know you can do it the shortcut way is that first we will create the method and pass the array as the parameter blah 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 then we will sort the array in the descending order okay now remember here is the important thing if you do a minus b then you will get an array in ascending order but if you do b minus a you will get the array in descending order so if you have gone through my a minus b logic then you will try the same in mind you will understand that it will sort in the descending order now you know that the second largest number of a sorted array in descending order will be the second number of the descending array right the first will be the largest and second will be the second largest therefore we will use the index one to pick the second element of the array that simple and that is the solution of this question great write a function to reverse the order of the words in a given sentence or reverse the words not the characters okay it's different so for example here is the sentence hello world now you have to reverse the words and something like world hello so see uh, uh, characters not reversed only words now for that first create the function and pass the sentence as the parameter then split the sentence into an array of words by using the split method okay here uh, then you have to reverse the array of words by using the reverse method at last just join the reverse words into a new sentence by using the join method and uh, a space between them you have to put some space right so finally you will get the reversed sentence write a function to find the longest common prefix among an array of strings 
So what does it mean first uh, longest common uh, prefix? Suppose you have these three elements in an array and now you want to find the common prefix. So what is it? This, these three elements have this common prefix fl, right? fl, fl, fl. So that should be the output fl. For this, first create the method and pass the array as the parameter. Here, first we will consider that the common prefix is the first element of the array and that is flower. Let's just assume. Now you will iterate through the remaining elements, second and third, and comparing it with flower. First, we will start with the element at first index of the array, and that is the element flow. So here we will use the while condition and we will find the index of the prefix flower in the element of the array at index one, which is flow, right? But flowers is not present in flow. Therefore, this is result will be minus one and minus one is not equal to zero therefore this while condition will be true and the execution will be go inside now inside here we will remove the last character from the prefix flower okay uh, by using this slice method so now our new prefix so basically we have to you know this prefix which we initially set to flower we have to somehow get the fl in this prefix only we have to keep on doing the logic so uh, okay so now here we will get the new free uh, new first prefix which is flowe because we removed the last uh, character by using this slice method then again the while condition will run and this new prefix is also not present in flow right then again we will remove the last character from the prefix and now the new prefix after removing the e last character will be flow f l o w and this time flow is present inside flow matlab flow is present in flow right therefore the result will be equal to zero and this will while loop will not execute and the common prefix we get from the first two element values is flow now then the upper for loop will execute the second time now the value of the i is equals to 2 and at index 2 the element is flight our last prefix was flow but flow is again not present in flight so again this will be equal to minus 1 which is not equal to 0 condition will be true will go inside and remove the last character w from the prefix flow then the prefix will be flo just again flow is not present in flight right again o will be removed this time now the prefix will become fl which is present in flight now this will become uh, a zero this con uh, and uh, the while condition will be false and the for loop is also completed because the maximum length of the array is only three so we got the prefix right the fl we got is the final prefix and the expected output of this program good now you are doing really great if you are getting it and understanding it write a function to find the intersection of two arrays what is intersection suppose you have two arrays one two three four and two three five six here you can see two two three is the intersection it's common basically and that is the expected output of this function first we will declare the function and pass both arrays as the parameters and then we will use the set object to store only the unique elements and remove the duplicate elements from the first array okay so then we will use the filter method to create an array of common elements that intersect here we will apply the filter method to array 2 so one by one all elements of array 2 will be passed as the array uh, as the element parameter and then that element will be checked to see that whether the set of array one already has that element or not for example the first element uh, first time it will check that element two of array two is present in set one two three four and it is present right so the condition will be true and an element two will be added added to the intersection array then that will be checked with the remaining elements also of array two which is three five and six in set out of them only three is present so that will be added in the intersection and rest will be ignored so finally two and three will be the elements of the intersection array
write a function to calculate the Fibonacci sequence up to a given number. A uh, very important question and very frequently asked. Uh, first of all, you have to remember two points about the Fib Fibonacci. Fi sorry for the pronunciation. <laughs> it's Fibonacci series or Fibonacci, Fibonacci, whatever. So the first point about Fibonacci series is they always start with zero and one. So always think uh, you have to be clear. Second point is each subsequent number is the sum of the two preceding numbers. For example, suppose you have to get, get the Fibonacci series up to number 10, then this will be the output. First, always start with 0 and 1 and then from the third number onwards, the third number will be the addition of uh, previous two words like preceding two numbers, which means 0 plus 1 equal to 1. Uh, then next time, uh, fourth will be 1 plus 1 equal to 2, then 2 plus 1 equal to 3, 3 plus 2 equal to 5 and so on. Like this, we will have a total of 10 elements in the array, right? This is the Fibonacci series. Okay, so uh, now for this, first we will create the function and we will pass 10 as the parameter. Then first we will initialize the Fibonacci series with the first two number, which are always 0, 1. We know. Second step, we will use the for loop, where we will start from index 2 which means the third element because first two elements 0 1 we already have and we will set the value of the third at at the index position 2 uh, as the addition of the second and the first element which is 1 plus 0 equal to 1 on next iteration the index will be 3 and the element will be 4 and we will set the value of the fourth element by uh, adding the third and the second elements which is 1 plus 1 equal to 2 and like this we will get the complete Fibonacci series of the 10 uh, number 10 or any other number you can get uh, by this logic okay uh, so that is the solution of this problem and I hope you liked it